Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I thought you were teaching this week. No. Okay. Well. <laughs> just, I did. I did. I did, and I feel I feel really good about it. Good. So, fortunately. But let us let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your kindness in bringing us together at this time and in this place. Lord, may your blessing rest on us all as we seek to understand your word and to know what it is that you've said, what happened in the past, what you have planned for us in the future, how we should apply this. And Father, we cannot do this without your help. So we invite you here, Lord, please come here and help us. Help us to understand and uh, help us to have a good conversation about it and help us to walk away and do something as well. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Today we will get through Isaiah 19 and 20. Hello, Chris, Kim. Welcome. I was praying and I forgot to pray that they would be here, but there's no need. So... <laughs> All right, sorry. Okay, so we're in Isaiah 19 through 20 today. And this uh, 19 through 20 is going to end kind of my whole section uh, that started back in chapter 17. And then uh, next week, Dylan will have us in 21. Yes? No? I haven't looked how far yet. Okay. Probably just 21 if I guess. <laughs> Dylan will get us through 21 verses 1 and 2. <laughs> um, okay, let's start out with this little thing here. Does that really, it doesn't really count as a meme, though, right? I don't know. All right, whatever. Maybe, maybe we should change our approach. <laughs> maybe if I change the formatting of the meme, they'll laugh at it. <laughs> yeah. What do you all think about this? Smart man. Smart man. Yeah. <laughs> very, very forward-thinking man. <laughs> yeah, he was way before his time. Okay, uh, this is a problem, though, isn't it? What is this really? A bit of something information, Mister or Miss? Yeah, little, little misinformation. But there's also a little bit of truth to it as well, right? This is, this is kind of, uh, it's being, uh, it's trying to teach you a lesson about not trusting what you see on the internet, right? But this pertains also to the following four questions I have for you. Question one, how much time are you spending on studying God's Word? In a, how about in a week period? 168, out of 168 hours in a week, how many hours are you spending Studying God's Word. Yeah, I know. It's, it's an answer? Yeah, if I do. And since you volunteered, no, <laughs> I'm not going to put you on the spot. Well, shamefully, maybe 30 minutes a day, an hour at the most. Shamefully, 30 minutes to an hour a day. Anybody have her beat? From a I would think I was doing good if I did that. Quantitative, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, it, it's not just about quantity, though, right? Right. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, what do you do when something in God's Word confuses you? Tell me about that. That's not putting you on the spot to give, you know, times. Uh, look at cross references. Cross references, right. What's a cross reference? I don't know. Now, uh, I go to the concordance and look up different stuff for it. Other scriptures? Yeah. yeah. Google. Google. Ah, there you go. Google. Okay. <laughs> what else do you do? Anybody else uh, concordance? Pray for clarity. Prayer. Pray and seek. Pray and go seek. It's a new kids game. Pray and go seek. Discuss it with my husband. Talk about it over with someone else. 
Anything else? I go to the Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> 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 That's an answer, though. That's a good answer. And sometimes Aramaic. Never Aramaic. Reading in different uh, versions. Okay, okay reading it. Same verse in different versions. Yeah, like the NA, the NIV versus the NAS versus the KJV, the NKJV. I go to my kids' new international version for early readers version. Oh. <laughs> and it's in those clarified. <laughs> The Adventure Bible for Clarity. That's wonderful. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, people go to children's Bibles or kids' Bibles for Clarity. It, it's like a paraphrase, right? It's trying to write it in, in terms that anyone can understand. Yeah, to their credit, you know, what, I mean, it's, it's an interpretive yes. explanation, but at least you're getting someone's attempt at clarifying and making it very, very simple and straightforward. Yep. That's right. Okay. And, um, isn't that great? That kind of just answered that. Brilliant. Uh, what, what are the res how about this? What resources other than the Bible, what are you using? There we go. Okay, a concordance, which points you back to, amen. But it's a, a different resource. It's a tool. Carla mentioned it, but got questions is a pretty good site. Got questions. Yeah. Right. Do you have a bad opinion of that? No, I don't. <laughs> you just, you got to be careful. You know, Abraham Lincoln was right. He didn't say there's nothing you can believe, but you can't believe everything. I'll go to like sites that I think are that are good. Like John MacArthur has a great website. Okay. BibleBB.com. A trusted scholar's website. Trusted scholar's website. He has the amount of sermons he has on there and different topics is insanely amazing. Yeah. And that that's much safer than just <laughs> Google. Yeah, but Google can lead you to that, which is good. What other resources? Commentary. Okay, commentaries. And the commentaries may lead you to even more resources. In fact, if anybody here reads the Net Bible, the New English Translation, they have, especially their notes, the one with notes, it has so many extra biblical sources that they draw on. So... All right. And uh, what if you don't, don't care about studying God's Word? That's a good answer. That is a very good answer. What if you don't care about studying God's Word? Yes? Wes? Hey. Cousins. Okay. Yeah. What happens? If you don't care, what happens, right? If you don't care, you come to something that confuses you in God's Word, you don't care to try to figure it out, this is the result. It's either something that goes in your cloud of mystery. Well, that's just something that, and, and you may even say, well, no one can understand that, and that may become your opinion. But what if you actually could understand it, and you're going around saying no one can understand it, right? Okay, uh, so what is at stake if you don't understand what God is saying? And this all plays heavily into all these chapters I've been in. And I didn't do the exercise this time as much, because I, I already know it's full of a wealth of different opinions. I mean, I, I'd looked at some different scholarly opinions. But chapter 19 of Isaiah plays so heavily into the future with a lot of people and they have all these different ideas. This one guy he said that it's definitely referring to America even though it explicitly says Egypt. Um, he says well it's figurative and all sorts of this stuff happens. So I know of a couple that decided to go on the mission field because they had a feeling that uh, 
chapter, Isaiah chapter 19 was about to be fulfilled. Okay? And so their purpose in going there was because they were thinking that chapter 19 was going to be fulfilled. Okay? So their missional decision had a base of a wrong motive. What should your motive be in any missional endeavor? Huh? Win people to Christ. <laughs> the centrality of Christ. That's why you go. You go to a lost world. Therefore, go into all nations, right? All nations. So if you're going to one because it's a hot topic and you think, I'm going to be a part of whatever this prophecy that's unfolding, you need to check your motive. Okay, it's okay if you have that thought. Maybe God used it to lay it on your heart. If you're going to go to Egypt, who, you, who <coughs> is the most important type of person that you should have a heart for? Okay, the Egyptians. Muslims. Muslims. <laughs> yeah, you better have a heart for Muslims if you're going to go serve as a missionary in their lands, right? Uh, misinformation leads to spreading lies. Remember what our, our friend uh, Hal Lindsey said a few weeks back in reference to uh, Isaiah 17. He's, he's spreading lies. Ugh. And that's very unfortunate. Because uh, I still maintain I like the guy. I just think he was wrong. Sometimes you've all spread lies. Sometimes I've spread lies. Or maybe it's just me. I don't want to speak for you all. Yeah, anybody else ever spread lies? Do you like doing it? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. If you give, if you, hey! <laughs> yeah, but in this case, is it intentional or unintentional? Okay, that's good. good distinction. Intentionalized versus unintentionalized, right. But if you find out that you've spread an unintentional lie, it's probably not going to feel, make you feel any better. You may feel worse. Think about all those people that died that were uh, followers of Jim Jones. But I think that goes to motive, though. Motive, yeah. It goes, yeah, to motive. Uh, misunderstanding leads to frustration. You just give up, right? You don't understand something in God's Word. You just give up. Yeah. Forget it, right? And then that, that robs you. What does that rob you of? The understanding you could have of God's Word. Yeah. And your closeness to God. Your relationship with God. He says to you, daughter, know me. Son, know me. Okay? And so you, you miss out. And then misdirection leads to the wrong focus. And so if, if somebody is focusing their life, let's say, on end time prophecies, okay, they have the, the direction that they should be going in is being misdirected. All their focus is on arguing with people about when the tribulation is going to happen and who is the most likely candidate for the Antichrist that's on the earth today. When really your focus should be on what? Serving and obeying God. Serving and obeying God specifically rhymes with <coughs> hospital. <laughs> the gospel, right? That was the best I could come up with. Hospital. It's like hospital. All right, but the gospel should be your, your focus should be there's a, a lost world out there. And you arguing about uh, if you're millennial, amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, pan-tribulation, rapture, all of that arguments about that, if that becomes your focus, you've been misdirected. Okay, all of that being said, we're going to get into a difficult chapter, another one. I hope you get some some difficult ones like these. Yeah. <laughs> Next time we do Isaiah, you get to go through this, and then we'll compare notes. Right. <laughs> All 
Okay, Isaiah 19. So if you would turn in your Bibles, if you haven't done so yet, Isaiah 19. Here's a beautiful picture of the, the, pyra <coughs> the pyramids at Giza in Egypt. All right, so let's, let's talk about the backdrop of Isaiah 19. It is likely written before 711 B.C., and that will become clear as we talk about the next chapter for sure. Um, if you recall, when I, when I asked you earlier what resources you're using, one of the greatest resources you can use to understand the Bible is to read historical sources that exist that, about things that are happening at the same time. Because, as we've seen, God uses nations to accomplish His will. He uses one nation to judge another. And then he judges that nation that judged, that he used to judge, right? And so if you want to fully understand what it is that's happening, it's vital that you learn the history if you want to fully understand, okay? And so I told you about Tiglath-Pileser uh, called Paul in the Bible. He reigned at this period. He's the one that we were looking at in Isaiah 17 that fulfilled that prophecy against the northern kingdom of Israel and uh, Aram, well, mainly Aram. But uh, 17 is dealing with the fall of Damascus. Remember? All right, they fell to Tiglath-Pileser in 732 B.C. Next we have Shalmaneser. He's not ruling for very long, so he doesn't get... I'm not going to talk, talk about him. It's not much to say right now. So he's a transition to Sargon II. Sargon II uh, reigned from 732 to 705 B.C. He is the one that defeated the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. And then also the Philistine city of Ashdod in 711, which is going to become important for next chapter. Uh, he helped to fulfill 17, the fall of Damascus and the fall of Northern is or the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and he also might possibly be the one who fulfills part of Chapter 19. Um, and then there's Sennacherib, who helped to fulfill Chapter 18 when God promised what looks to be a deliverance, a supernatural deliverance. Remember the army of mice, mice. the army of mice that defeats them as they're going into fight against, as the Assyrians are going into fight against the Egyptians and the kingdom of Cush, uh, they're defeated by an army of mice. And uh, of course, we, we get to hear that from Herodotus. You know, he's a well-known, you know, read some Herodotus. He's good to read. Doesn't mean that they're always right, and they may fumble some things here and there in history, but these are good guys to read, Herodotus. Okay. Uh, so Sennacherib, though, there's this awesome deliverance by God. And God even, it was, he was sending a message to the uh, people of Cush. He said, I'm going to do it. Okay, and when I do it, you're going to send gifts and, and offer offerings to Jerusalem. Okay, and that was his message to Cush. He said, be watching for it. Now, Esarhaddon is the last king that we're going to talk about in this section. He's the king that reigned from 681 to 669. He is going to go a few years later and beat the pants out of Egypt and Cush. Okay, so we're going to see that he is the guy that, uh, I, I think he's more likely the guy that's being talked about in Isaiah 19 and especially 20. But we will get into 20 here in a little bit. All right, let's read chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. The oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So I will incite Egyptians against Egyptians, and they will each fight against his brother and each against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And then the spirit of the Egyptians will be demoralized within them. And I will, I will confound their strategy so that they will resort to idols and ghosts of the dead and to mediums and spiritists. Moreover, I will deliver the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel master and a mighty king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. Now at this reference to swift cloud here at the beginning 
God is riding on a swift cloud and he's about to come on Egypt. This talks about, or does it sound like that's referring to something that's far away, like even to our future. Keep in mind, this is likely written before 711 BC. Does it sound like it's recent or, or, or like it's in our future or does it sound like it happened a long time ago? For God to say he's riding on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. Well, it seems like such an easy answer when you put it that way. I'm afraid. To <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like an easy answer, and I, I think it is an easy answer. But what should drive really answering that is the context, right? Okay, so uh, verse 2, verse two, it says, I will incite Egyptian against Egyptian. They will, fight against, uh, they will each fight against his brother and each against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. But the interesting thing about this period in Egyptian history is they are being uh, more and more controlled by Cush. Uh, Cush, if you recall, is underneath Egypt, and they're driving more. And Cush is also called Ethiopia uh, and Nubia. Anyone here Nubia? So it's, it's referred to by many different names. They are starting to take over and control more of Egypt. And even in Moses' day, uh, Josephus talks about how Moses actually was fighting against them. And he was pushing down further and further. So these two nations, they're right up against each other. They're going like this, trying to control. And I'm going to tell you what, the better land is in Egypt. So if the people of Cush can go further north, they're going to get better land. Of course, if the people of Cush go further south, they're going to get better land there too. So their land's not that great. Their land is right. I'll show you where here in a minute. But Cush, ever since 760 BC, Cush is gaining more and more control of Egypt to the point where they're taking over. And Egypt has a, a bad problem where the classes are fighting against each other. The warrior class and the priest class, they're all struggling for dominance. And uh, Egypt itself is broken up into different types of districts or, or little kingdoms, city-states. And they're fighting with each other, all for control. And now check out how great this strategy is. While this is happening to Egypt, it's the most best opportune time for Cush to come in and start to take over, right? Imagine uh, if you're going to take over America, what do you want to see happen to America first? Division. Division, civil war, all the kind of stuff that Sun Tzu was talking about. Get them demoralized, soften them up, and then when you come in, maybe they'll even hail you as bringing order, right? Okay, verse 3, this is typical of the Egyptians. You see what he said here? He said, uh, I will confound their strategy so that they will resort to idols and ghosts of the dead and to mediums and spiritists. This is typical for the Egyptians to do. I've got an awesome quote on, quote on the next slide for you to see. But notice how the Egyptians learn nothing from Exodus, right? <clears throat> They're gods were clearly shown as just silly idols that were powerless. And yet, it did not change them at all, right? When they are delivered from Sennacherib, it is not going to change them at all. Even though this letter went to Cush, which they should have been aware of, this is not going to change them at all. The Egyptians themselves are going to continue turning to their own fake gods in, in this cruel cycle which we'll see here on the next page. Um, and the cruel master was likely Esar Haddon, the king who comes in and just totally destroys them and brings many of them in as exiles. Okay. So that, that happens in 671 BC. So not too long after. All right, but let's think about uh, this, this problem that Egypt is in uh, when Satan is your teacher. Okay. This is out of John Calvin's commentary on Isaiah. This is what he had to say about Isaiah 19.3. And I, I thought I'd put this up here just because this is really fascinating uh, insight into people like the Egyptians who uh, always want to, their wisdom is supposed to be so great. And, and the secret knowledge that they have. 
and learning secret things and drawing you in because I've got secret knowledge and you have to come hear me. And, and when you reach the next level, I'll show you the next level of secret knowledge. So this applies to the Egyptians. It also applies to any sort of secret society. It says here, uh, in reference to these Egyptians and superstitious people in general, Indeed, Satan deceives them in such a manner that he first, uh, first he holds out to them the appearance of peace and quietness, which they think they have fully obtained. But afterwards, he shows them that they have not reached it, and distresses and harasses them more and more, <coughs> and compels them to seek new grounds of confidence. Thus our minds cannot obtain rest and peace, but in God alone. If any man shall wish to be wise in any other manner, he must have Satan for his teacher. You see that vicious cycle that the Egyptian society as a whole had been in? Why, they could not see, even when their gods were defeated. You know that the priests explained it away. And certainly, when Sennacherib is defeated, they do build a memorial to their god, their fake gods. Who delivered them. What a pity. They missed it. Surely they read what Isaiah had written, what God had sent to Cush. Anyway, uh, this, this is the danger. This is a, a very cruel cycle to get involved in and always drawing you back in. And right when you think there's peace and security, something happens. Says, well, now let me, let me take you to the next level. There's no end to the levels of lies. Okay. All right. Uh, 19, 5 through 10. The economic collapse of America. Sorry. <laughs> of Egypt. Yeah. The waters, the waters from the sea will dry up, and the river will be parched and dry. The canals will emit a stench. The streams of Egypt will thin out and dry up. The reeds and rushes will rot away. The bull rushes by the Nile, by the edge of the Nile, and all the sown fields by the Nile will become dry, be driven away, and be no more. And the fishermen will lament, and all those who cast a line into the Nile will mourn, and those who spread nets on the waters will pine away. Moreover, the manufacturers of linen made from combed flax and the weavers of white cloth will be utterly dejected, and the pillars of Egypt will be crushed. All the hired laborers will be grieved in soul. You got to understand something about Egypt. Okay, and uh, actually I've been teaching my daughter about this quite a bit lately. After the Tower of Babel incident, when people come into Egypt after their long trek, they find this beautiful green area and it is lush. This is over a hundred miles across. There's lots of lush green land because the Nile splits up and, and it veins its way into the Mediterranean. It's such a green paradise. And indeed, go to Google Earth and you can zoom down in and follow the Nile all the way down and you will see that all along the Nile it's green. There's life. And where there's green, um, there's, there's animals coming to eat, there's fruits that are growing, there's land that you can plant your crops in, there's land for your flocks, okay? But if you take that away, if you take the Nile away, what happens? <laughs> yeah, there's, everything starts to dry up and die. And then now you're living in what? The desert. The desert. <laughs> That's right. You're living in the desert. Okay, so they actually call the, the Nile at flood stage, they call it the sea. Okay, because it becomes like a sea at flood stage. And, uh, but flood stage was a very, uh, it, it was pretty, uh, the, the season it was, it was pretty uh, consistent as far as it was going to flood. If it doesn't flood enough though, there's going to be famine. If it floods too much for too long, the ground's not going to be good for the seed and you're going to miss the planting season. So this balance, uh, the, their economy, really hinges on the balance of the Nile and the consistency of the Nile. 
So throughout Egypt's history, this type of event has happened to them many times. And when that's, uh, if all of your eggs are in the, uh, I'm investing in the Nile basket, and when the Nile runs dry, then all your eggs were in one basket, and you're kind of doomed, right? So you can imagine in, in Joseph's day, that's why they had seven years of plenty, and they banked all the grain that they possibly could from those seven wonderful years, and then I know the Nile dried up, because if it didn't, well, there'd still be food. Okay, I'd say probably the, the climate in the whole area dried up for those seven years of famine. Okay, so, but uh, because their economy is based on, this, on the uh, so situation with the Nile, Nile then they're doomed. <laughs> they're doomed when it dries up, and there's nothing they can do about it. Oh, and by the way, down here is really the land of Cush, all in here. But zoom in on that if you get a chance, and then you'll see, you will see how green it actually, because up from this high up, it looks like desert. I mean, who would ever want to live in this disgusting area? There's no life there until you zoom down in, right? Okay, uh, 11 through 15. 11 through 15. The princes of Zoan are mere fools. The advice of Pharaoh's wisest advisors has become stupid. How can you men say to Pharaoh, I am a son of the wise, a son of ancient kings, well then, where are your wise men? Please, let them tell you, and let them understand what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. The princes of Zoan have acted foolishly. The princes of Memphis are deluded. Those who are the cornerstone of her tribes have led Egypt astray. The Lord has mixed within her, hear this, the Lord has mixed within her a spirit of distortion. They have led Egypt astray in all that it does, as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. There will be no work for Egypt, which its head or tail, its palm branch or bulrush may do. No work in Egypt. All right, so these, he's referring to two major cities in Egypt. Uh, the first one is Tanis, which you may recall Tanis was from that great movie, which tells you where the Lost Ark is. Raiders of the Lost Ark, they uh, found where it was located in, in Tanis. Now that's, of course, fantasy. But Tanis is over here on this portion of this very fertile land, right here. Okay, And uh, Memphis is down here. And Memphis is actually the capital where the uh, Cush Pharaoh is at. This, is, this becomes their capital city. And so they've they're controlling Egypt from here. All right. In fact, um, it, it even came out recently. Some history channel or, or something, or Time magazine, something has the black pharaohs. Okay. The pharaohs, they'll, and they'll say from Nubia or Ethiopia. Some will say Kush. But it's pharaohs that were black that were the actual pharaoh of Egypt. Okay. But it's a foreign pharaoh. <laughs> Good question. Do I mean Memphis, Tennessee? Now, this is, this is funny because I did listen to somebody who said this is obviously referring to America because America has Memphis of their own on the mighty river. The Mississippi is going to dry up. <laughs> okay, and Memphis even has a pyramid. One of their sports centers is a pyramid. So, but no, this, this one is not <laughs> the same. I know. All right, so the wisdom of Egypt is legendary. And it's legendary because they were very wise, and very wise in their own eyes. And they were also very deceived, right? Uh, consider the, the base of their understanding and the cycle that they're in. And any time anything new happens to them, isn't it going to go through that filter <coughs> of deception? And when it's through that filter of deception, then they're not going to understand the truth. So God is mocking them here. He's saying that they're fools. <laughs> they're stupid, right? And, and then he kind of challenges them the same way that he challenged Job. Hey, Job, where were you? He's saying, hey, why don't you all, since you're so smart, why don't you explain what I'm doing? Okay? 
But also notice the control that God has, because in verse 14 he says, The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of distortion. They have led Egypt astray in all that it does. The leaders have led Egypt astray because he's mixed within them this distortion. Okay, God, if you uh, recall, God does these sorts of things as an act of judgment. When you hate the truth and embrace lies and embrace that which is evil, God allows you to go ahead and do it then. He tries to pull you away, gives you the opportunity, but if you say, I don't want to, at some point you're going to fully embrace the distortion, and that's exactly where these Egyptians were. So, and he is, he is preparing them for what comes next. All right, verses 16 and 17. <laughs> Verses 16 and 17. In that day the Egyptians will become like women, and they will tremble and be in dread because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which He is going to wave over them. The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which He is purposing against them. God says... In that day. Okay, now in that day can mean a few different things. It can mean uh, just in a sequence of events. Now we've come, Egypt is in this terrible situation where they're fighting against each other, kingdom against kingdom, Cush against Egypt, district against dr district, uh, warrior class against priest class. Okay, and then they're losing their economy. He's preparing them for this moment. And now, perhaps it refers to in that day after these things. Okay? But in that day can also refer to the end times judgment, the day of the Lord. Okay? But really to understand this, and to understand anything in the Bible, you've got to take it in context. Okay? So this context of this particular in that day is in a sequence of events that have led up to the Egyptians becoming like women. Um, that is not a slight on women. When, we, when you're talking about uh, warfare, right, and brave warriors, we can handle anything, or men who can handle any problem, and we're the, we're the leaders, we're the heads, you're talking about a nation who is not able now to handle these sorts of things that need to be done. If an invading army comes, you want strong men. Okay, now in the future, when everyone's wearing these mechanical suits, and you know, it doesn't matter how strong you are at that point, you know, we'll, we'll see. But however, today, or back then for sure, they become like women. They're ill prepared for what is in front of them, for the task that men have to do. Okay, and so it says here that uh, in that day, it's, it's a history event, and I'm going to try to tie it to everything that was already said. That's why I say that uh, Esharadan, the king, the king of Assyria, becomes their cruel master. And he just rolls into Egypt like Hitler <laughs> rolled through France. Okay, it, it should not have gone that fast. And you can read these. These are accounts that Esarhaddon had left, written. So you can actually read them. I, I read them. That's another good source. Okay. Um, now the second verse, uh, 17, the land of Judah is a terror. The odd thing is that Hezekiah, of course, rebelled against Assyria. And those are in the days of Sennacherib. Whereas Hezekiah's son Manasseh actually is in league with the Assyrians. And Esar Haddon mentions Manasseh specifically when he calls all of his vassals together for this great uh, invasion that he's going to do of Egypt and Cush. He calls them all together and, he's, and he names Manasseh as one of them. Okay, And, and that is the neighbor to Egypt. All right? Judah is the neighbor to Egypt and now Judah is on their side. And it specifically says the land of Judah 
will become a terror to Egypt. Okay? Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which he is purposing against them, against the Egyptians. All right? So the, the land of Judah is a terror to them because before, in, in the days of uh, Sargon in, in Sennacherib, they were talking, Judah was actually talking about being in league with Cush and Egypt. Remember the, uh, uh, chapter 18? Cush had sent emissaries to Judah to say, hey, let's join together. Let's form a league. And the, the response back is, we're trusting in God to deliver us, not our league with you. Okay. But now, that's all gone. <laughs> Hezekiah is dead. Manasseh is alive. Manasseh is a bad man. And he is in league with Assyria. Esarhaddon. Esarhaddon. All right. Um, verses 18 through 24. Now it's going to get hard. <laughs> Are we out of time? No. Plenty of time. All right. I guess we'll do it. <laughs> Here we go. No, it's just 18 through 25. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One will be called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the middle of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offering, and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing. So they will return to the Lord, and he will respond to them and will heal them. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people. And is Syria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance? Any questions? <laughs> Chapter 20. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we don't get off easy though, right? This is what I'm talking about. You come to something confusing. You can give up and say no one can know. Or you can say, well, that's obviously what's happening today in Egypt. And, and people have done that throughout the history of uh, we believers, people have done that throughout the history and said, oh, this is what's happening to Egypt today. And I must act because of what Isaiah said. All right. Okay. So the in that day is going to become chronologically challenged. Such a politically correct term. There's a problem. Okay. Suddenly the Egyptians are believers in God. Egypt is allied with uh, Israel and Assyria. And this is a day that is uh, after this previous judgment that was on Egypt because now they're on God's side and suddenly there's an altar to God in Egypt. <laughs> All right. Okay, so there's, there's a problem here, right? This, this is not something that we see happens when Esar Hadan rolls through Egypt and, and defeats them. This, we don't see this sort of thing happening at that time, but there's solutions. The in that day uh, may refer to a time that's even further down the road instead of right after that, instead of a chronological sequential uh, event, one right after the other, okay? Oh, and then did you notice God strikes Egypt in order to heal them? God cares about Egypt. Okay, so here's historical option number one. This one's really fun and, and should hopefully spur you on to being interested in reading some of these other ancient texts. Uh, remember the, uh, uh, about another, little over another hundred years, the uh, Judah is going to go into exile into Babylon, okay? 
And of course, you remember the Jews then 70 years later are let, allowed to come back into the promised land. Well, when that happened, when the exile happened, if you read in, in Jeremiah especially, a lot of them went to Egypt. And Jeremiah also went to Egypt. Okay, So you have uh, believers in Egypt, and you do have believers in Assyria as well. Some uh, Israelites that are believers, right? The remnant, the remnant that's preserved, right? So there's well-established Jewish communities in Egypt and in Assyria. Now, a few hundred years later, in the second century BC, uh, after the Egyptians, or ra rather after, so you, you have uh, Assyria's controlling, then Babylon's controlling, and then uh, Persia's controlling, and then Greek is con Greece is controlling. During the time that Greece is controlling, uh, Josephus writes about this incident where this man named Onias, who is the son of the high priest, who is also named Onias, uh, he has a petition that he writes to the king and queen of Egypt at that time, which has become Hellenized. Egypt has become Hellenized at this time, and it is ruled by the Ptolemies. After Alexander the Great's empire split apart, he split it into his four generals, and then they fought over the territory uh, until the Romans. But this guy Onias, or Onias, uh, he writes to Ptolemy the Sixth, who's called uh, Philometer, and his wife Cleopatra the Second, not the one you're thinking of, uh, although she's pretty, I think. Um, she's got a little, her face is falling apart, but that's all right. <laughs> this is her husband. Let's <laughs> run in the family. I don't know. Uh, all right. So, but he writes them a letter saying, I want to build a temple in Egypt because of what Isaiah was talking about. In fulfillment of what Isaiah was talking about, I want to build a temple in Egypt. And they, we have the letters. Josephus has preserved them. He has the letter that o Onias wrote, and he has the response that Ptolemy and Cleopatra wrote back to him. And they were all for it. They wanted to please God. It's pretty amazing. And they built the temple. Did you know that? No. Yes, <laughs> they did. See, and all he had to do was read Josephus and learn about the other Cleopatra and uh, yet another Ptolemy. But they're, they're very happy to do it. And the temple is going to stand until uh, 73, A.D. 73. You know, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed in 70. Three years later, the temple in Egypt is destroyed. Okay? Uh, this, same guys, the Romans. It was uh, Titus also. <laughs> okay? According to Josephus, and Josephus uh, would have been there as an eyewitness. Uh, for, for that one, not for the building of it. So it stood for a couple hundred years in Egypt, where it should be, too. So Onias did yes. it because he wanted to fulfill yes. the prophecy? That was his stated purpose? Yeah. He's the son of the high priest. He's so very he's zealous. Egyptian high priest. Yeah, but still the Jewish. Oh, it was the Jews in Egypt. Yes, yeah, the Jews in Egypt. Sorry, yeah. The Jews in Egypt that are uh, living there as um, uh, exiles, but that this is their home now. The Jews, just like the Assyrian Jews, they're living in Assyria. It's their home now. And the Babylonian Jews and the Persian Jews and the Jews wherever they are in Europe, they're living at home as uh, in exile, okay? In the diaspora, right? Okay, so these ones in particular built this in the second century and then it was finally destroyed, but it stood as an actual working temple where they did sacrifices. Um, so the modern Christians in Egypt, I mean, maybe their origins come from this Jewish community who were evangelized? Yeah, it could be. It could very easily be. Of course, Egypt, I mean, you think about where they're located. If you're going to go by land from Africa into Asia, where do you have to go through? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And if you're coming from Asia and you're going to go into Africa, Egypt. you got to go through Egypt. That's right. Yeah. 
So, and that, that's exactly the thing. You're going to get this huge mix of people. Then you, you have the Assyrians taking them over, the Babylonians taking them over, the Greeks taking them over, now it's the Ptolemies, and sometimes the Seleucids come and they take it over, and then the Romans take it over, and then Rome splits, and then you've got the Eastern Roman Empire that starts to fall apart by the time the Muslims take over and have held it ever since. So they've been through a lot. So whether, whether it's just the, the community of Jews that were there back then or some huge mix... I was just curious. We can figure it out, though. Yeah. His, his promises to them, there's apparently something future here, but it could be to the church that he still recognizes. Yeah, it could be. And that's, that's going to be the next option. But, oh, but uh, here's the problems with this particular one. Okay? God's people here are still the Jews. Now, Ptolemy and Cleopatra wanted to appease God, but they certainly didn't forbid all the other uh, polytheists that are in, uh, in Egypt at the time. So they wanted to appease God, yet another God that's living in their land. Okay? And so it's not Egypt as God's people or Assyria. It's the Jews in Egypt and the Jews in Assyria that are God's people. Okay? And then Assyria itself is part of the Seleucid dynasty. Assyria would be up here. This is the Seleucid dynasty, and these are the Ptolemies. And these two fought each other all the time. And who was in between them but the Holy Land. Okay? And, and there's some amazing history in there that you could read about. So the fact that these two are not really united, <laughs> and they're fighting over the Holy Land, pokes holes in the theory that this was fulfilled in the days of Onias or Onias or whatever. Okay? So that's an issue. But of course we don't have all the information yet. Uh, historical option number two. The Christianization of uh, the Roman Empire. In particular, the Eastern Roman Empire. Okay? You've got uh, Assyria would be up here and down here is Egypt. You have the Holy Land in the middle. And they're united. Okay? They're Christians. They're Eastern Orthodox Christians, but they're Christians and they're united. Uh, the, but there, there are problems here. Okay? They're united in Christ. But some of the problems here is the temple was destroyed in Egypt, it was not rebuilt. But then again, we are temples to the Lord, right? We believers are. And uh, you could make that kind of argument. Uh, and all three kingdoms were ruled. They're not separate kingdoms that are allied, unless you want to say that the, the fact that they are uh, joined together because of the Eastern Roman Empire might be a, a way in which they are united. But it's not like the three of them separately. It's, okay, we're all, we're all part of, be like it's Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana joined together, but we're already states in America anyway. Okay, so there's holes in this idea. It makes sense a bit, okay, but if both of these historical events, or if you can come up with some more, or as we find out more historical information, we might be able to find out that, hey, it was fulfilled back then. As it stands, neither one of these sufficiently fulfills what exactly we're looking at here. So that leads people to look to the future option. And so uh, in verse 20, if you remember what verse 20 said, it said, it will, come, it will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, unknown oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. Maybe that's a reference to Christ's second coming. And this has to do with the millennial kingdom and the eventual enormous borders that we see uh, promised to Israel of how large their borders will be. And it depends on who you're looking at, who's going to interpret what for what. But it is a large land that does encompass Assyria, uh, Israel, and Egypt, at least the Nile. Um, so maybe it's fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ. Okay. Yes. You said the second coming of Christ. Could it not also possibly refer to the first coming of Christ? Or no? Okay, so the first coming of Christ is going to happen during the Roman period. And so Rome is also... But then you're, you're dealing more with uh, the young church spreading out. Uh, obviously, when Christ comes, 
we are looking at something new, then let's continue to do sacrifices in Jerusalem. Okay, we're looking in putting your faith in the ultimate sacrifice, the fulfillment of all the prophecy. And then as, as the church spreads, then it can also become kind of the same thing. Uh, but then, and there was still a temple in Egypt at that time. So, but it's going to have problems because <laughs> it's, it's going to have the same problem as the Eastern Roman Empire and that it's not Assyria, Israel, and Egypt. It's, oh, Rome's controlling us all. Isn't that wonderful? Bottom line is, it's tough. And it, it's good to say, I don't know. All right? Some of the issues with the future often is, uh, option is, what do you do with the historical account? I mean, Onias <laughs> did build a temple. And we don't know all the things that happened in those days. You know, this highway and them all joining together, we don't have all that information. And new information may come to light. Uh, and then, yeah, what if, yeah, what if information comes to clarify? You know, then I think the lesson to learn is, you know, I, liked, I love to use the illustration of how tightly I hold my opinion. You know, just be careful. <laughs> With how tightly you hold your opinion, it may be forced to change. My take is that 19, 1 through 17 is clearly looking at events in the past. Something changes in verse 18 through 25. It might be the, the past, maybe the future. I'm fine with whatever it is, though. It, it, it may be, oh, that's the other one. It could be both. <laughs> Was it the past or future? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 20. Any questions from that, from chapter 19? I yes, ma'am. I think it is so beautiful how it ends up. The Lord Almighty will bless them. He said, Egypt, my people, and Assyria, yeah. my people. Who, who does God have a heart for? The nations. Mm -hmm. It is so beautiful. That's right. So. Okay, judgment on Egypt and Cush. Hey, look, it's a black pharaoh. And that is uh, supposed to be one of them. There were several. Okay, God's judgment on Egypt. Chapter 20, we'll read the whole thing. This is not very long. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, in the year that the commander came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and captured it, at that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips and take uh, your shoes off your feet. And he did so, going naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Even as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot three years as a sign and token against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Then they will be dismayed and ashamed because of Cush, their hope, and Egypt, their boast. So the inhabitants of this coastland will say in that day, Behold, such is our hope, where we fled for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria. And we, how shall we escape? Uh, don't put your hope in Egypt and Assyria. Put your hope in the Lord. So we see that the purpose of the judgment, it's a judgment against Egypt and Cush explicitly. Unless it's America. Wait a minute. Some said chapter 18 was America, Cush. And then chapter 19 is America, uh, uh, Egypt. So maybe it's America and America. I don't know how the who... I want to see what those guys have to say about chapter 20 then. Can you imagine all, you know, we just read, can you imagine all the things they could come up with? <laughs> all right. So it's a judgment against Egypt and Cush for not trusting God. They were delivered from Sennacherib by God. But who do they thank for it? They're fake gods. And it's also to show Judah that God or the remnant in Judah, that God is their only hope. You can't trust in other nations to, to save you. And so this was written in uh, 711 or 709 BC because that's the year that Sargon took over 
Ashdod, which is in the, the country of the Philistines. Okay? And that's, we're given that historical marker right there. Uh, Isaiah's nakedness. He's naked from uh, 711 to 709 B.C. Um, and it's, it's a specific sign, right? In the same way that Isaiah looks like this, you're going to look like that. And it's quite, it must be a striking sign uh, to see. You know it's going to cause a lot of discussion, right? And he's a high-profile kind of guy. All right, and then the event is the fall of Ashdod under Sargon II. Second. This signals a break in um, the relationship between Egypt and Cush and Assyria. Both of them are jockeying for position to control uh, this land in, in Philistia and to control these major port cities along the Mediterranean. Okay? Well, Assyria is now going to establish dominance, and this is going to put Egypt and Cush in a bad situation. Uh, so, King Sennacherib, if you recall, he terrifies Judah up to their necks. He gets defeated by the army of mice in Egypt and by the plague in Jerusalem. And then Judah considers joining first force. Uh, Judah at that time had considered joining forces with Egypt and Cush, looking for salvation uh, by other nations. But then uh, Egypt and Cush are utterly defeated under King Hasarhaddon. Okay. So this, this is the backdrop of what takes place. This is the fulfillment of what he said, in my opinion. Some say that it may have been Sargon, but Sargon did not defeat them. He may have taken uh, some captives into Assyria, but... Esar Hadden is the one who came down there and just rolled right over them. And then <laughs> took them naked. Okay. Um, and that's, that's basically, we already went over this. So my, my take is that it either, chapter 20 happened here with Esar Hadden because he su su uh, successfully defeated Egypt and Cush. But this whole section you got to know your history in order to understand what is being talked about. If you don't know your history, or if, you, if you're completely ignorant of this, then who is going to set the context for you when you turn on the TV to hear a message on Isaiah 19, or 18, or 17, or 20? Who's going to set that context for you? When, you? when you watch the Hal Lindsey Report, or the Lindsey Report, whatever it is, you're going to be taken in. This is hard work to get to the bottom of all this, but it's so worthwhile to see what God has done in history. I mean, these are historical events. And this is prophecy concerning these historical events. So your uh, good applications for the day is always trust in God. Right? Uh, you can trust in other nations back in those days. That was the temptation. For us in America, when things in America look bleak, you trust in God. His plan cannot be changed. Okay, so don't worry about Obama or uh, who's going to be the next president? Another Bush, really? Scott Walker. Walker? <laughs> Scott Walker. Does he have it first? Is it Luke? Luke Scott Walker. Luke Skywalker. Yep, you got it. And when things in your life look bleak, trust in God. He has the plan. His plan cannot be changed. It can't be stopped. And there's there's nothing that any of those nations could do about it back then to stop it, except for obey. <laughs> you know what should Egypt and Cush have done? Oh, the Lord said he was going to deliver us years ago by the mouth of Isaiah the prophet. And now we've been delivered. Let us trust in the Lord. Rather they said, oh, our gods have remembered us. Let us trust in our gods. And that played into the priest class fighting against the warrior class. See, you warriors didn't win this battle. What are you doing? Really? Really? Was he doing a selfie? He does that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, that's...
it for that section. Any questions? All right, so I, I think that 19 may have some future implications. So, but un until then, I'm just going to hold my opinion like this. It's okay to say I don't know. But it's never okay to stop trusting in the Lord. If you do, well, we have plenty of examples. <laughs> just read the Bible <laughs> and you'll find plenty. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and your word. If you have more things to teach us or to teach somebody else in this class, some better understanding they have in these passages, lead them to it, Father. Lead me to it. Lead us to it. Because we want to understand. We love you. We want to know you more and we love what's happened in the past and all the examples you've given us. But Lord, you have really, really challenged us to trust you regardless of geopolitics. And to trust you regardless of all the terrifying things that we see in our own lives and in our own spheres. Help us to trust you. Help us to stay focused on what you have called us to do. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.